everybody. I am the call. Um, I'm a member of Crochet Guild of America, and um, I'm actually a certified master crocheter. I know, nothing stranger than somebody else's hobby, right? But today I want to talk about crochet, Queen Victoria, and the Irish potato famine. And yes, they are related, believe it or not. So let's get started here. So crochet comes from the Latin root um, and also morphed into uh, French, and it means hook or small hook. Um, it's the same root as crozer. Um, some Christian traditions um, use a crozer um, as a shepherd's hook to um, to designate that a bishop is the shepherd of his flock. And so you see right there, that's the crozer, that's the hook. And keeping with the Irish theme, that is St. Patrick. So just saying, okay? So we have to kind of back up a little bit into the 15 and 1600s when lace becomes very popular for both men and women. Um, it's very expensive, so only royalty and the aristocracy can afford it, but also the church can afford it. And they would actually start um, putting together convents that were formed to produce lace for churches. There's basically, at this point, two types of lace, needle lace. Um, this is an example of needle lace. Um, it's done with a needle to make lark's heads, very similar to tatting or macrame, okay? But much smaller, so much smaller, it t sometimes would take as many as 6,000 stitches to do a square inch. Wow. Amazing, <laughs> yeah, it is tiny. It takes a while. The other type of lace was called bobbin lace or pillow lace, and it's called pillow lace because you would sit with a pillow in your lap as you were doing it. But you can see the bobbins here. Um, um, but both of these are very labor intensive, and they take a lot of pins. Um, the, the, the staff that kept coming up with both pin and needle uh, lace, or I'm sorry, uh, bobbin lace, were 200 hours to produce seven inches. 200 working hours for seven inches. And I was figuring out that that was probably about 30 hours for a square inch. So the other thing you'll notice is this is using a whole lot of pins. Now remember, pins would have also been made by hand. So um, they were also labor intensive, but they were very necessary to do the lace. A French princess would order 12,000 pins at a time. So how many of you guys have heard of pin money? Pin money, okay, okay. Well, guess what? I didn't, the first year I was married, the first um, New Year's Day, my husband handed me some money and I'm like, uh, what's this for? And he said, it's your pin money. And I said, huh? And he explained that for the next year I had to buy all of my pins using this money. And anything that was left over, I could have. I was like, okay. <laughs> and he's, he's done it for 41 years so far, so God bless him. But in, in researching this, I realized where pin money came from. Um, in, the 1500, in the 1500s, there were sumptuary laws. And one of these laws that was passed is that commoners could only purchase pins on January 1 or January 2. Got that? So I had to have my pin money on January 1 if I wanted to purchase any pins, right? It was kind of a, you know, buying it all up before the hoarders get it sort of uh, option. But, but the royalty would try to buy up all the pins so that their lace makers could make all the lace and no one else could get it. Interesting, huh? So where did crochet come from? Well, we really don't know, to be frank about it. They have found hairnets on Egyptian mummies that really actually look like crochet. Fishing nets are another thing that look a lot like crochet. And the other thing, the conjecture is that crochet came from broken needles. Now think about a needle with an eye and the eye broke. And you think about it, you've got a crochet hook. Put, put um, like a cork or a piece of wood on the end, and you've got 
a modern crochet hook. And that's kind of the, cro the conjecture. There was a French order of nuns, the Ursulines. Again, they were putting together lace for church vestments. And they are really thought to codify crochet as we know it. And one other important thing to remember about crochet is we can only be done by hand. There has never been a crochet machine. There's knitting machines, there's, there's machine lace, but crochet can only be done by hand. Cool, huh? Yeah. So it becomes important, the Ursuline nuns um, back in the late 1700s, early 1800s, um, were being brought over to Ireland by some philanthropic women who thought that um, uh, they could be used to actually educate um, poor Irish girls um, and uh, to fight poverty. And they were called finishing schools. Now, they're not finishing schools like we would think of the aristocracy, but they're finishing schools teaching them some basic reading and writing, but actually more handwork. They taught the basics, including crochet. Now, crochet was considered easier to learn. If you think about it, it's only got a few basic stitches. And again, it's less labor intensive. Remember, it's about 20 hours to do seven inches of lace in crochet. And they think by about 1840, 10 to 12,000 of these girls had actually completed finishing school and probably knew how to crochet. Now, Irish crochet is a little bit different. They're done in motifs. Um, the motifs are worked separately, and then they're later joined, so there's division of labor. And actually, a girl would come home. She would teach her family how to do it. Everybody did it. Mom, dad, the kids, grandma. Everybody could crochet. And usually, a family would have a specific motif or two that they would do, OK? Um, and, and there was quite a rivalry, you know, who did the best, uh, had the best motif. But these are crochet motifs. Um, the interesting thing on a side note is the family might only have one or two hooks. And I had a class with Nancy Nearing, um, the, the Victorian button that's out on the table uh, was the class. But she was talking about, you know, they didn't have the range of hooks that we have. You know, we have 14 through Q, you know, which is tiny to huge. Um, they would have one or two hooks but they would make gauge. They had such good control of their crocheting that they could make gauge no matter what size of hook. I always remember that when I'm not making gauge. Okay, I got enough hooks, I can do this, I can do this. So always remember that. Um, but this was truly a cottage industry. So then what they would do is they would actually bring these motifs together and uh, they were pinned out on paper or sometimes fabric and then they would crochet or sew them together to make a finished object. So this is a collar. Isn't it beautiful? The other thing, um, the tradition was they were done in white thread. Well, white thread was pretty common, but you also got to think about a grungy cottage. Well, they could bring them in and bleach them, and they would all match, okay? So you weren't trying to match colors. And that's where the tradition of Irish crochet done in white thread, okay? So the second part of this, I said Queen Victoria. <coughs> queen Victoria was born in 1819 and became the, the queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland in 1837 through 1901. I just have to throw this in here, okay? Queen Victoria's knitting. Victoria, as much as she liked to knit, was not all that skilled at, in the art. There's a story told that on one occasion, Victoria was visiting a Scottish household near Balmoral Castle and presented her hostess with a pair of socks that she had knitted herself. There was an elderly woman also present who was hard of hearing and hadn't quite grasped the visitor's identity, who loudly remarked, if her man gets no better made socks than that, I pity him. <laughs> Fortunately, Her Majesty was amused. So we have now established she wasn't a real good knitter. Anyway, in 1840, she married the love of her life, Prince Albert. She, um, she wanted a lace wedding dress um, the two principal lace-producing countries were France and Italy, 
But she's the monarch. She's the trend center. It's her responsibility to advocate for her, her country. And so she chose English lace, specifically Honiton lace. And here's her wedding dress. This is the actual wedding dress. It probably was much more white, um, but that's the actual dress that survived. It's kind of aged into this beautiful cream. And this is the sleeve detail. I believe it's bobbin lace, but isn't it beautiful? Um, she also later had a christening dress made for her children, and it was Honiton lace. So what I want your takeaway to be is Queen Victoria loved lace. Everybody, Queen Victoria loved lace. Very good. OK, so the third prong to this is the potato famine. So Irish potatoes. Um, potatoes were actually a new world food. They came from the Andes. And actually, they're the fourth most common food crop after rice, wheat, and corn. Okay, The Irish uh, peasants actually grew a, a variety called lumpers. And lumpers were developed as animal feed, believe it or not. Um, but they were easy to grow. Anybody, you know, you, you chop them up, you make sure you got an eye, you get it into the ground, and a potato grows. Now, but there was no variety. That was part of the problem. OK, an adult male could eat 14 pounds of potatoes a day. Got that? 14 pounds of potatoes a day. OK, kids, they're not French fries, OK? <laughs> but ironically, um, they're actually pretty healthy. Um, add some greens that they could collect, and you actually had a pretty good diet. Potatoes even had vitamin C. It kept off scurvy. But when it got to Ireland, where they're eating 14 pounds a day per person, it got bad. Um, it's a type of water mold fungus light oomycite. And I will probably butcher it, but I think it's phytotharu infestans is the actual thing. Um, what would happen is the crop could actually die in a day. So you'd get up, your crop would look fine, you'd come back, and it would be completely wilted. Um, if you actually ate a potato that was infected, it could cause illness, diarrhea, vomiting, even death. Okay, You did not want to eat it. And people were starving. Um, 1845, it kind of happened. Part of the problem was they were losing their seed potatoes. So they didn't have anything really to plant. That was a problem. And by 1847, there was really a big problem. And in fact, uh, it's called Black 47 because there was basically no food. People were dying from dysentery, scurvy, fever, cold ex exposure, and typhus. One of the things that happened was that the laborers were too weak to work and therefore couldn't pay their rent. So they started evictions. Does that sound kind of familiar recently? Um, the landlords would even um, dethatch. As you can see, these are the dethatchers. Because people would just move back into the house after they were evicted. So they would actually ruin the house so that it was un uninhabitable. Um, and, and this is in winter, so people were freezing to death. It's, it was terrible. Um, the problem also was that landlord, landlords were absentee. They would actually have a manager. And the problem was the, the, landlo the landowners could make more money with dairy, beef, flax, grains, and they would export it to England. There was enough food, but it was being exported. OK? So it wasn't really good. Um, people would actually dig a hole and live in the ground out of necessity. Another thing that started happening was some people would actually choose to leave to emigrate United States, Canada, sometimes even Australia. Um, these were called coffin ships for a reason. Um, they, were, they were terrible. Um, Sometimes the landlords were so desperate to get people off of their land, they would actually pay to get them on coffin ships. Um, some of the captains were so unscrupulous, they would remove the ballast from the ship and put people down in there. It was horrible. Um, this is a scene from um, 
below deck, overcrowded, disease rampant, um, and one in three wouldn't survive the trip. This is um, a quote from Brian Murphy in his book, Adrift, A True Story of Tragedy on the Icy Atlantic, and one who lived to tell about it. This is pretty gross. The stench quickly grew overpowering, the unmistakable acid-sweet smell of vomit infused every corner. The only place to retch was in your berth or into the floor. Washing up was out of the question. The only way to do that was with a bucket and some fat lye soap. The two latrines for 120 people were simple holes that emptied into the bilge water a horrific concoction of waste in the hold below the steerage compartment where they were. Rags soaked in vinegar were provided for common use as stand-ins for toilet paper. Can you imagine? No. Very, yeah. This is a little side note, though. This is the Jeannie Johnston, and big thanks to Karen Nicholson for bringing this one to my attention. Um, she was an emigration ship from 1847 to 1855. She actually sank in 1858. They would take immigrants over to the Americas, and then they'd come back with lumber. Um, uh, what is amazing is this ship never lost a single person. Um, they are said to have had a humanitarian captain. They even had an onboard ship doctor. And, um, but they never lost anybody. Even when it sank, coming back, um, no one was lost. They actually were able to pick up the entire crew. To honor the Jeannie Johnston, a replica was created in 2000, and in 2003, it sailed across the Atlantic. Um, and one side note to that is that maritime law, because of the size of the ship, modern maritime law in 2003, would only allow 40 people to be on this ship, 40 people. It averaged between 240 and 250 people when it was bringing immigrants across. Yeah, very bad. Um, and it is now moored in Dublin, Ireland, and it is a, um, a, famine, a famine museum. Isn't that neat? So what was the government response? Well, the government already had a series of workhouses. Um, they were established, but they were overrun because people were so um, hungry that they would try to overrun the workhouses. It didn't wor work well. Another scheme was they had a ship come from America with US corn. When it arrived, it was dried kernels. Well, first off, nobody recognized corn as a food source. They also didn't have any mills that could possibly um, actually grind it. They didn't know how to cook it. Some of them would try to eat it raw. It was a mess. It was a very big disaster. Um, soup kitchens sprang up. And these were usually run by church groups. The Quakers get a particular good nod because they were very gracious in feeding people. Um, and the soup, kitchen, the soup kitchens actually helped a lot of people. But crochet co-ops. Now remember, as I had said, that about 10 to 12,000 girls actually knew how to crochet and probably had gone home and taught mom, dad, and the kids how to do this. So what they started, um, philanthropists, ministers' wives, would actually invite families to come. They would feed them a meal, and they, they would you know, bring your crochet hooks. If you don't know how to crochet, we'll teach you. And they actually started growing crochet. <clears throat> now, um, the problem with crochet was the perception it was called poor man's lace. Someone got the brilliant idea that, hey, Queen Victoria loves lace, yes, <laughs> woohoo! And someone sent her some lace, Irish lace. She loved it. And remember, she's the monarch. She's the trend center. She's the rock star. And when she started wearing it, it was the cool kid stuff. Everybody had to have Irish lace. This is fantastic. And she actually promoted it even in, um, in the 1851 
uh, London exhibition, she showed Irish lace. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. So they started forming crochet co-ops, and these people would uh, bring their crochet, and they were actually able to find brokerage houses, and the brokers would buy the lace, and they were actually starting to be able to pay the crocheters for these motifs. And interestingly, these brokerage houses, one of the biggest one, ones was San Francisco, believe it or not. I mean, that's how far flung this was getting. Um, but the brokers bought up the lace and the people paid for it. Okay. Queen Victoria crochets. <laughs> so she took the stigma away from crochet and she promoted the Irish lace. Um, but she was so taken with it she actually learned to crochet. The speculation is she probably had one of her maids or someone that knew how to crochet and kind of taught her. And in, in fact, in her diary, she said that it helped her with her grief uh, after her husband's death in 1861. Is that cool or what? <laughs> we have a queen. Now, this is one of the weird side notes, but Queen Victoria's scarves. She crocheted eight scarves and as you can see, it's just kind of a basic scarf, but it was given to soldiers from the South African War. Six are known to still exist. They think two burned up in fires. And the description is crocheted in khaki-colored Berlin wool, approximately nine inches wide, five feet long, including a four-inch fringe at each end. And it bears the royal cipher VRI. That's the cipher right there. Is that cool or what? These things are just wild. And if one goes on sale, they'll go for millions of dollars now. Museums will, will give their eye teeth to get these scarves. And usually they stay within the families. They were worn as a sash, and they're technically not an official military honor. <laughs> Got that. Anyway, so Queen Victoria crochets. We are the cool kids. Yeah, and that's an actual picture of her crocheting. Um, and she loved it. But we have other famous crocheters. Um, we have Cher, and it didn't take her real long to make that dress. Um, <laughs> Vanna White, of course, every, everybody knows her. She has her own uh, line of yarn. That is a picture of George Washington Carver, the famous scientist known for his agricultural um, peanuts and soybeans. Um, but he loved to crochet. In fact, he did quite a lot of handwork. The others, we not only have a queen, we have a vice president. Vice President Kamala Harris crochets. <laughs> we are the cool kids, I tell you. Trisha Yearwood, Meryl Streep, Rosie Greer. I only... Wow. <laughs> Who knew? I, I mean, he was always a needle pointer to me, but, you know. And for you youngsters, he was a football player. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to show you this beautiful Irish crochet wedding dress. It's a, from the 1890s, and I guess it, it, it is an authentic um, antique, but it was used in the movie Titanic. But isn't it beautiful? But as I was saying earlier, it looks like um, Elizabeth Beardley's dress up in her um, bedroom, doesn't it? I mean, you can kind of see some of that style. Um, crochet today. This is a crocheted wedding dress. It was made in 2020 or 21. Um, but you can see this Irish motif going together. Isn't that beautiful? These are crocheted coral reefs, and they're showing diversity. And they're installed at museums. Um, this one is in Australia, but I believe the Smithsonian has one, too. Um, and they're beautiful. Isn't that cool? And this is the one that I, hadn't, I didn't see coming, kind of. Um, crocheted bouquets at the Beijing Olympics. Did anybody else notice that? Um, you think about it, they can't take live um, plants uh, or animals out of a country, and so they actually crocheted these, these bouquets to the medalists, and that's what actually was presented. From what I understand, there were some live flowers, and it probably was for people that were more domestic. Um, and then they were crocheted, they called it the crocheting aunties of, of Beijing. <laughs> but this is actually what, what one of the roses looked like. Isn't that beautiful? So there are a lot of famine memorials. This one is in Dublin, Ireland. This one is 
this one haunts me, but I really wanted to include it. So in 1845, the population of Ireland was 9 million. 1845, 9 million. 1 million would starve to death. 2 million would emigrate. By 1855, the population of Ireland was 6 million. It has never recovered to this day to that same number of people. So 3 million people lost their lives or left Ireland. 